I had previously mentioned that there are many ways to create your headcount model depending on how you look at it and depending on what data is available. This example is the creation of a headcount model related to workload drivers. So this is a real case study from an automotive tier one supplier. They are a global manufacturer and they are growing. Well, that sounds like good news, but what are the top challenges for growth? They are concerned with actually growing profitably. Will they have enough cash flow? Can they afford the cost of their workforce? So they would like to keep headcount costs in line with revenue growth projections. They would like to determine which jobs will actually be impacted by revenue growth the most, so they know where to put their additional headcount. And they would like to build a numerical model of headcount for a time span of three to five years out. If we take a look at what drives this company overall, for they are a manufacturing company, customers drive production volumes. The production volume drives the number of factories they need. Within each factory, the volume drives the number of production lines or manufacturing cells. The number of manufacturing cells drives the number of factory workers, supervisors, engineers of various types, and program managers. Outside of manufacturing, we have support functions like IT, HR, supply chain, and finance. So these functions essentially support the actual factory operations. You can see now as we work our way through these connections, we are working from the customer level down through this structure into the workforce level. Let's look at the support functions since they are most common across companies. It will be easier for everyone to understand rather than looking at job roles which are specific to this company's manufacturing process. So let's take a look at finance and accounting. What do you think drives workload for these positions? When we began to brainstorm, we recorded items like the number of customers they have to support, the number of locations they have to support, and the number of countries in which the company operates. For supply chain positions, we looked at the number of containers that people would move, the turnover of shipping personnel, and the number of new locations opening. For HR, it's very clear that there would likely be a connection between the number of HR headcount they had and the number of employees they support. Additionally, for some portions of HR like recruitment, they would be related to the number of open positions they're trying to fill. An additional factor would be the number of locations that HR has to support. In IT, we started thinking about ideas like connecting to the number of devices that IT has to support, the number of locations they have to support, and the number of actual quotes won. This is specific to this one particular company because they happen to have their CAD function in IT. So the next thing we did was to take our potential list of metrics and take a look at how those metrics trend over time relative to the headcount patterns in each area. Was there or was there not a connection between this historical data and the historical data of headcount? So to build a headcount model, we have to consider how these metrics trend over time relative to the headcount patterns in each area. Then we need to determine how do we actually project these numbers forward? We can use the relationships between the metrics and the historical headcount in order to project headcount forward in our model. However, we may also want to consider the impact of efficiencies. The relationships we've developed between the metrics and the headcount assume that the business will always operate in the way that it always has. There's really no impact of improvement. So you may wish to consider the impact of efficiencies. What continuous improvement activities are underway? As an example, if you are in procurement, your workload would go up if you start to support an increasing number of suppliers and customers. However, if you have a continuous improvement initiative underway to move from manual paperwork into EDI transactions, your workload would actually start to go down. We need to somehow account for these efficiencies when we project our model forward. This type of example of building a headcount demand model is more complex than the simple model I showed earlier in this course. As you can see, it will require the availability of a lot of data on the selected metrics. This won't be available in all companies. This example is provided to illustrate that there are many ways that you can create your headcount demand model. The model you create will likely be a function of the data and resources available for you to study.